gentle listener, and welcome to Nocturnal Transmissions, the fortnightly podcast that brings you dark tales, both old and new, performed by voice artist Kristen Holland. This episode, we're happy to be sharing another story from our friend, R.T. Reno. That name rings a bell, you may well have just declared, gentle listener. Well, of course it does. This is, after all, the third offering we've shared from this talented writer who brought us Missing Presumed Dead in episode 64 and the unforgettable Mirror. Mirror in episode 48. Easily the most meta offering we've ever produced on nocturnal transmissions. If you are yet to acquaint yourself with this episode, do seek it out. It'll bake your noodle, as the Matrix's oracle would say. Anyway, this time around, we're going underground. Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present R.T. Reynos City Hall Station I've always been intrigued by ruins. The act of settling somewhere and then giving that place up is so contrary to the normal human experience that it typically only happens when it needs to. By finding out the reason a particular location was abandoned, one can learn about social societal priorities, changing times, cataclysms. The story of how a civilization ebbed and flowed is told in part by its ruins. So, Needless to say, I'm a big fan of the TV show Abandoned Mysteries. Each segment of the program showcases an abandoned site somewhere in the world, an old dam in Italy, a convalescent home in Denmark, a military outpost in Russia, old west ghost towns, modern-day ruins, telling the story of how today's societies are ebbing and flowing. One day I was watching the show when it had a segment on the City Hall subway station in New York City, my hometown. From my own personal experience, I already knew that the terminus of the downtown-bound number 6 subway line was Brooklyn Bridge Station. When number 6 trains stop at Brooklyn Bridge Station, there is an announcement telling you that this is the last stop on the train and that all riders are to exit. The train then travels down the track around a big loop underground and arrives on the opposite side of the station, heading uptown towards the Bronx. But, as the show informed me, there used to be one last stop on that big loop. City Hall Station. While most subway stations generally look like there is always a risk of getting into a fight with a rat armed with a used heroin syringe, this one is Beautifully adorned in Gaustavino tile, Roman brick wainscoting, decorative skylights and brass chandeliers. It harkened back to a time when the subway was a novel, sophisticated method of travel. The show further explained that the short platform of the station could not support the trains as they got longer to accommodate increased ridership. Because more people just use the nearby Brooklyn Bridge station anyway, the decision was made sometime in the 1940s to shut the station down. But the loop would still be used to send six trains back uptown. That means all six trains leaving Brooklyn Bridge station to go back uptown still pass through the old City Hall station. But the station itself has been abandoned. And so it sits used dozens of times a day by trains, but forbidden to pedestrians. All one would need to do to see it, however, is stay on the six train after the announcement to get off, and the train would take you on a brief tour of the abandoned station. To be sure, the show warned that anyone caught disregarding the announcement could get a summons from the NYPD. But the idea of seeing a modern-day ruin up close and in person smack dab in the middle of one of the biggest cities in the world, 
was titillating. Just stay on the train. Easy enough. I felt I just had to take a look. One night, I got on the six train heading downtown. I figured that if I did this later in the evening, there would be less of a risk of being caught by police. That, and it might make the whole tour of an abandoned subway station concept a little creepier, giving me a little more bang for my adventurous buck. I took a seat and the train traveled south. When it reached Brooklyn Bridge Station, the train doors opened and the announcement came on telling everyone to exit the train. Like everyone else in the train car, I exited the train. But unlike everyone else, I hovered on the platform. After waiting for the train employee to sweep the accumulated garbage out of the train car, I snuck back on, sitting in a not-so-obvious spot on the car, just in case anyone else wandered by. After a couple of minutes, after the garbage had all been cleaned up, the train doors closed, and the train started traveling down the track. The train traveled slowly and cautiously, all the while making a loud, screeching sound. The tunnel was almost claustrophobically narrow, brightened at intervals by signal lighting. I stared out the train window, eagerly. After a few minutes traveling down the track, the patterns on the subway tile began to change, and the tunnel opened up into a small cavern. City Hall Station, read the sign on the wall. Unlit chandeliers hung from the station ceiling. The skylights overhead illuminated the station in a low, purplish light. I could see that the platform of the station served primarily as a storage area. Large five-gallon buckets littered the platform, stacked alongside rectangular piles covered in tarps. As we traveled around the curve, however, I suddenly saw a man come into view. He was standing on the platform, staring down the track ahead of us. From the clothes he was wearing, I got the sense that he was homeless. In that moment, I recalled thinking that it made sense. If I was homeless, what better shelter could I find than an underground subway station nobody used? But then another man came into view, also homeless-looking, also staring down the track in the same direction, and then another one. And then a small group of them. There seemed to be a congregation of homeless men standing on the abandoned train platform. I flattened my face against the window glass to look down the track as best I could, trying to see what they were looking at. As the train inched closer to the center of the platform, the group of men became thicker. It had to have been fifty or sixty people all standing around. It looked like rush hour. I heard the train's horn blare. The men did not respond to the noise. The men did not even look at the train. Then I saw a pale woman with long, disheveled black hair come into view. She stood several steps up on a staircase at the center of the platform which served as the entrance to the station. She was wearing a white wedding dress. The dress was splattered with some viscous fluid, like a bucket of it had been dumped down the front of her. It dripped onto the staircase. It was hard to make out in the low lighting, but the fluid looked red against the white dress. It looked like blood. Could have been blood. Her arms were raised up and her head was tilted back, facing upwards. I could see that her eyes were closed. She had been saying something, or at least her mouth was moving. I couldn't hear her over the train. It looked like she was addressing the congregation of men arrayed before her on the platform, the group of men who all silently looked at her. It almost looked like a sermon. I could feel my eyes get wide, trying to take it all in. Suddenly, 
The woman's head snapped downward, and she opened her eyes. Now that they were open, I could see that her eyes were completely black, like chunks of volcanic glass. She glared at the train, at me. The interior of my subway car was fully lit. She could most certainly see me sitting in the train. Our eyes locked. Her head, those eyes, were tracking me as I rode down the track. There was no place to hide. I felt a chill in my soul. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. Her mouth moved. I couldn't hear what was said. Without a sound, the sixty or so men on the platform turned in unison and looked at me. All of them had the same black eyes. Their stares all slowly tracked me. I was terrified. These men were standing just outside of the window, staring in, staring at me. There was no way I could get a read on their intentions. I threw myself back to the bank of seats on the far side of the train, hoping they didn't try to break their way in here. I mean, what could I do if sixty homeless men attacked the train except hope that the glass didn't break? My fright was then punctured by a woman's voice. Join us, it said in a pleasant, ethereal tone echoing as if spoken into a canyon. I didn't hear it with my ears. There was no direction that sound came from. I heard it inside my head. I looked around to check that nobody was actually talking to me in the train car, and then looked back at the woman who still stared at me, as did all the other people on the platform as I slowly rode by. Join us. The woman's voice in my head held on the last note, sounding like a hiss. Join us. Join us. Join us. With each refrain, the voice seemed to become lower, the words more drawn out. Other voices came in, male voices, female voices, old voices, young voices, all chanting, join us, on repeat. The voices picked up tempo and rhythm, furiously repeating themselves over and over again. The volume steadily rose, the words began to lose meaning, the voices lost humanity. My mind filled with the drumbeat. It was hypnotic. It was relaxing my muscles, putting me to sleep. I could feel my eyelids get heavy. I fought the fatigue. I slapped myself to keep myself from falling asleep. With the slap, the drumbeat stopped, replaced by a singular male voice. Deep, loud, harsh like how I'd imagine a lion would sound being pushed into a wood chipper. What say you? I was too weirded out by all of this to have a coherent response. Almost reflexively, I whispered, No. No sooner had I spoken than everyone on the platform started screaming and pointing at me, all screaming, all at once, all at the top of their lungs. I could hear it inside of the train car. I could hear it over the screeching of the train on the track. I heard the woman on the stairs screams over everyone else. She was louder and higher pitched, and her voice seemed to be reverberating off the walls of the station. Her eyes stared back at me. Her hands went up to her face. I saw her nails digging into the flesh of her cheeks. Her hands shook from the effort. 
Her screaming continued without pause, without breath. Blood ran down her face, dribbling down her chin and onto her dress. The train continued traveling slowly around the curve. Nobody on the platform gave chase. They all just stood where they had been, screaming at full volume. Eventually, they were out of sight. I stared out the window, not understanding any of what had just happened. I breathed a sigh of relief. I felt like I hadn't taken a breath through the whole encounter. The train pulled back into Brooklyn Bridge Station again, this time now heading uptown. The train doors opened. An announcement came on advising that this was a Bronx-bound six train. Nobody was on the platform. I sat staring blankly, trying to wrap my mind around what had just happened. Two train motormen walked by. They looked like they'd been looking for something. Someone. I saw one of them holding his radio to his mouth. Come in, dispatch, he said with a thick Brooklyn accent. Go ahead, the radio responded. The Blood Lady and company are back on the warpath. Notify the PD, Brooklyn stated. Understood. Remain in place. We'll notify the PD and post the travel advisory. Copy. Brooklyn said into the radio. Brooklyn then turned to his companion. Luckily, it's late and service is slower. When this happens during rush hour, it's pandemonium. They began searching again and, in short order, found me sitting in the empty train car. They both abruptly stopped their searching, as if I was what they had been looking for. Just like I thought. Hey, buddy! Brooklyn yelled at me. Y y yeah I stammered. Did you just get on the train? Brooklyn's companion asked. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ, look at his pants. He's been here the whole time. Here's the fucking reason this shit kicked off. Brooklyn said to his companion. At least this one didn't turn into one of them. I looked down at my pants. There was a wet stain down the front of them. I'd piss myself and not even noticed. I still hadn't come to terms with what I had seen. I remember thinking, I am the reason. What does he mean by turn into one of them? I wanted to ask for clarification, to ask what the hell just happened. All that came out of my mouth was, Huh? You just had to stay on the train, didn't you? You just had to rile them all up, Brooklyn continued. Who? My eloquent streak continued. Who? Who the fuck do you think? The goddamn hobo cult in the tunnel down there. You made him go ape. Brooklyn gestured to his companion. My buddy here is new. He almost shit his pants when they all started screaming. I didn't respond. I noticed for the first time that his companion looked wide-eyed and unsettled. I was hoping I didn't look as bad as he did. Brooklyn turned to his companion. Yeah, when assholes like this decide to stay on the train past Brooklyn Bridge, sometimes that cult down there flips their shit. They start running all over the tracks. We gotta send in the cops to flush them all out. Occasionally, one of them will touch the third rail and cook. It's a nightmare. Every Fucking time, Brooklyn explained. Wait, you mean you've seen them before? I asked, finally getting a grip on what Brooklyn was describing. Listen, you've already done enough today, pal. Get the fuck out of here before I tell those cops that you had black eyes when we found you, and you wind up down in the cell with them. I stood up and slowly exited the train car. Brooklyn held his radio back to his mouth. Hey, Rodriguez, you there? Yeah, I'm here, a voice answered over the radio. 
Close the train down. Dispatch says to remain in place while the PD goes on their bug hunt. Copy, the radio responded. Was it some asshole? Yep, Brooklyn said, staring me in the eyes as I walked past him to exit the train car. Just some asshole. An automated announcement then came over the speakers, advising that the train was closed for service and that everyone would need to exit the train. Several minutes after, the doors to the train shut and the sign indicating the train's destination turned off. A lady who had been walking up to enter the train approached the two motormen and inquired about when the train would be opening. Close for repairs. There are going to be delays on the 6. Take the express if you're going uptown. Brooklyn said, flatly. City Hall Station by R.T. Reno. If you would like to find out more about this author, just visit the Featured Authors page on our website, nocturnaltransmissions.com.au. If you are enjoying the podcast and would like to support us in some way, you can recommend us to your friends, write us a review on your chosen podcast provider, slip us a five-star rating on iTunes, or become an official patron of Nocturnal Transmissions through Patreon.com and snag yourself some extra content into the bargain. Pick one, or do them all. It all helps, gentle listener. It all helps. Speaking of help, we're very excited to announce the appearance of a new cohort amongst our Patreon supporters. That most exalted of ranks, higher than Minion, higher even than Acolyte, the very pinnacle amongst our beloved co-conspirators. Who is this philanthropic lover of dark tales, you ask? Why, Alex Brewis, gentle listener. Welcome, Alex Brewis, and thank you for your largesse. We also have some new acolytes who've recently pledged their support to our crusade. Laser Pants, Charles Basner, Mycophilic BG, and Nux Vomica. Welcome all. You know, our train oriented tale this week put me in mind of something. Something I believe worthy of discussion in Nocturnal Transmissions Recommend. The segment where we discuss matter of a dark nature that we have been enjoying and wish to share with you. Something we very much enjoy here at Nocturnal Transmissions are horror movies. Particularly when the movie in question is not only a great example of horror movie making, but also a great movie, period. Just a few days ago, we decided to re-watch a zombie film. A zombie film from South Korea. A zombie film called... Train to Busan. Revisiting this film, originally released in 2016, was prompted by the imminent arrival of its sequel, Train to Busan 2 Peninsula, which I believe will be available very soon. It was released across Asia only last week. Anyway, this sequel is an unknown quantity at this stage. What I want to talk about is its predecessor. Train to Busan tells the story of a group of passengers aboard a train outbound from Seoul, just as a zombie outbreak explodes across South Korea. 
At the center of this group is a driven young businessman and his daughter, who he is delivering back to his ex-wife, who, the child has expressed in no uncertain terms, is the parent she would rather be in the company of for her impending birthday. Needless to say, things, forgive me, gentle listener, go off the rail. This film has all the wonderful, undead-driven tension you would expect from a decent zombie outing, but also has that all-important element for truly compelling horror. Characters you care about. Our two main characters are performed with great aplomb by Yu Gong and Suan Kim. The latter, playing the daughter, delivers a child performance you will not soon forget. She is frighteningly talented. And the supporting cast, oh dear me, don't get me started, gentle listener. I will just say that Sang Hua, played by Dong Siuk Ma, is without doubt the person I would want by my side when the zombie apocalypse kicks off. Yes, we have been spoilt with some wonderful films emerging from South Korea in recent years. Why, lest we forget, Bong Joon-ho's film Parasite did win the 2019 Best Picture Oscar, after all. Oh, that's another film you need to put on your to-be-enjoyed list. Now, if you happen to be one of those people who avoids subtitled films, change your ways. You'll be glad you did. Train to Busan. Nocturnal Transmissions recommends it. P.S. If you have Netflix, you can watch the damn thing for free. So, what are you waiting for? This episode was brought to you with the generous assistance of our Patreon subscribers. A particular thank you goes out to our esteemed cohorts. Sam Bell, Donica Shelley Moody, Evan Dooley, Robert Troy Hampton Peterson, Michael Wood, and Alex Brewis. All non-public domain stories are featured with the permission of the authors. All voices and production are concocted by Kristen Holland. Until next time, as always, watch the skies, fear the dark, and don't trust anyone. Especially yourself. Good night, gentle listener.